Greetings. Professor Sands is kind enough to welcome us today to his brand new department at the Pierre Paul Riquet Hospital in order to make a self teaching video on the ultrasound exploration of the shoulder under the aegis of Sims. The outline is as follows. We will study the anterior region of the shoulder. Next, we will go on to the anterior superior region. Our third chapter will concentrate on the posterior region. The long biceps tendon originates from the supraglenoid tubercle on the upper rim of the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Its course is horizontal, here in contact with the head of the humerus. In the upper part of the intertubicular groove or bicipital groove, it then makes a 90 degree angle held in place by the retinacular pulley or biceps pulley. Its course will then be vertical. More or less at this level we will come across the myotendinous junction. This tendon will be held in place in the groove by fibers from the subscapularis. It will also be crossed over, just about here, by the pectoralis major tendon. At this level we have the pectoralis major tendon, the biceps, and more internally the latimus dorsi and teres major. Ideally, the sonographic examination of the long biceps tendon is carried out on a relaxed shoulder, in neutral position, with the back of the hand resting on the thigh and the palm of the hand facing upwards. Obtaining a short access image of the long biceps tendon at the shoulder is relatively easy. We must identify the intertubercular groove in the form of this bony cavity that we can see at the center of this image. The long biceps tendon is a hypoechogenic structure, oval in shape, and subject to anisotropy. In fact, when the transducer is tilted upwards and downwards, this tendon will light up and go out. This anisotropy maneuver makes it easy to analyze the tendon, especially in somewhat difficult situations. Just outside the tendon, we can identify a small arteriole, actually quite large in this subject, which is relatively constant. The exploration of the long biceps tendon continues upwards. We can see that the tendon remains at the bottom of its groove as long as the groove continues. We also see that inside, in the upper part, there is a small triangular hyperechogenic structure containing the tendon which corresponds to the distal extension of the biceps pulley. The biceps tendon will then turn to enter the joint. We will therefore swivel round in order to follow its curve with the transducer in the sagittal plane. Please note that the biceps tendinopathy usually begins in this area. We will then explore the long biceps tendon downwards. The groove is tapered off, but the tendon can easily be identified thanks to the anisotropy. As we move further downwards, we will see it go under the pectoralis major tendon, which is orientated transversely before it attaches to the humerus. The myotendinous junction of the biceps is located here. We will now go on to the longitudinal view of the long biceps tendon in its groove, which we can see here. Since the biceps tendon plunges distally, it is oblique, so you have to press on the lower part of the transducer in order to get a good hyper-echogenic image. The tendon can then be followed downwards up to its myotendinous junction, which you can see here. The muscle fibers appear starting at the point where it goes under the pectoralis major. The subscapularis muscle is a thick, powerful triangular muscle arising from the anterior aspect of the scapula. It is directed outwards, it is multifasciculated. It ends in a powerful tendon which inserts on the minor tubercle. It also gives off some fibers that form a bridge over the intertubercular groove, thus holding down the long biceps tendon. Ideally, the ultrasound exploration of the subscapularis tendon is carried out with the arm and elbow held against the body, with a slight lateral rotation of the shoulder. The next section is the axial section of the subscapularis tendon. In order to identify it, we must locate the coracoid process in the form of this bony protuberance. The tendon underlies it, it is orientated transversely outwards and inserts on the minor tubercle of the humerus. If you travel even further outwards, you will come across the bicipital groove. The subscapularis tendon is explored from top to bottom in the axial plane. Please note inwards the existence of a myotendinous junction, which must not be confused with subacromial bursitis. We will now carry out the dynamic maneuver of the subscapularis. The transducer must be correctly in place. If possible, we put both our hands on the patient to ask him to perform the medial and lateral rotation maneuvers. Go ahead. Up to the umbilicus inwards, we go all the way up to the umbilicus. Then outwards, we observe the behavior of the tendon under the coracoid. 
In some cases, there is a spontaneous snapping or a calcification. Please note that here the space is especially large. When we go back to an axial view of the subscapularis tendon, we note the existence of small hypoechogenic zones which are quite unsettling, as they could be mistaken for tendinopathy. In fact, as can be easily understood by revolving the transducer in the sagittal plane, these small hypoechogenic zones correspond to small conjunctive spaces located at the interface between the many bundles of the subscapularis tendon, which can be counted from top to bottom, 1, 2, 3, Four, five. Those bundles must be scanned as far as their insertion near the long biceps tendon. The coracoid process is the seat of three tendinous insertions, the most lateral of which is that of the short biceps muscle, which will merge with the long portion of the biceps. Above that insertion, you will find the tendinous insertion of the coriobrachialis muscle, which will insert on the medial part of the diaphysis of the humerus. This coracobrachialis muscle is traversed by the musculotaneous nerve. The last and most medial insertion is that of the pectoralis minor, which inserts on the third, fourth and fifth ribs. All of the coracoid region is covered by two muscles, the deltoid and the pectoralis major. Now, starting from this long axis image over the coracoid process, we will look at the muscles that insert on the coracoid. Traveling down, slowly moving through the transducer downwards, here you notice a hyperechogenic portion, which corresponds to the relatively long tendon of the short biceps. Here a more muscular, more internal part, which corresponds to the coriobrachialis, and more internally still, the pectoralis minor with the axillary artery. These muscles are located deep to the pectoralis major here and the deltoid here. Starting from this long axis image over the coracoid process, in favorable cases when going down along the coriocobrachialis muscle, we may be lucky enough to see it being perforated by the musculocutaneous nerve, which you can see here, under the arrow. By revolving the transducer in the sagittal plane, we can visualize the muscle bellies of these muscles along the greater axis. Notice here, the coriocobrachialis, which has a muscular portion straight away, and, more laterally, the short biceps, which has a tendinous portion.